Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Professor Kier Lieber, who's the director of the Center for Security Studies and the Security Studies Program, I want to welcome you all uh, to this conference on terrorism's changing threat landscape. I'm uh, Bruce Hoffman, and together with Tim Wilson from St. Andrews University, we've organized this joint conference. Uh, I'm extremely pleased because this is actually the fourth such conference that St. Andrews Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence and the Security Studies Program and Center for Security Studies have jointly hosted in Washington over the past eight years. Um, however, this is arguably the most significant uh, for two reasons. First, uh, this is one of the many events that has been unfolding since last semester. Last semester to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence. Uh, on a personal level, this is, has deep, profound meaning for me because I co-founded the center with the late Professor Paul Wilkinson in August 1994 and was its uh, first director. So it's always a tremendous honor and pleasure to remain involved uh, with the center and indeed to have one other former director here, Professor Richard English, as well as the current director, um, Tim Wilson. This is, conference is significant for another reason, and those of you who are devotees of these joint efforts will recall that our last cooperative venture was three years ago in January 2017, and the title of that conference was The Terrorist Threat, What the New Administration Needs to Know. And Richard English and I had planned that conference in the spring of uh, 2016 before the outcome of the election was known. Although the trends in terrorism were fairly clear, and I think that conference was remarkable now as being somewhat anachronistic. Uh, and indeed, two security studies students actually called me out. I was the former director of the security studies program. Called me out on it and published a very compelling uh, opinion piece in the graduate security studies um, review, where they pointed out that the conference had focused exclusively on the Salafi jihadi threat and on the threat from ISIS and the then uh, war against the caliphate by a coalition of 79 countries, had also discussed al-Qaeda. But basically, it ignored the entire range of other threats. And these two students proved remarkably prescient. And if anybody doubts that directors of security studies don't listen to our own students, who are the best placed often to advise us on emergent trends, um, we certainly did so uh, in planning this conference. Uh, there are seven panels. Interestingly, one of them is devoted to the Salafi jihadi threat, which remains a salient threat and an extremely important one. But this conference widens the aperture and takes a look at both emerging and future threats. So consequently, the six other panels address technology and terrorism, the Iranian terrorist threat network um, in Hezbollah, violent far-right extremism and the violent incel movement, the legal dimensions of terrorism, which we had not hitherto addressed, and um, terrorist group leadership as, as well. We're extremely fortunate this time around, too, uh, to have as our keynote speakers uh, Lord Evans, uh, the former Director General of the British Security Service, MI5, this afternoon, and tomorrow afternoon, uh, Nick Rasmussen, the former Director of the National Counterterrorism Center. We're also enormously privileged and honored uh, to have a conference that includes, as well as uh, Lord Evans, two other members of the House of Lords. Lord Carlisle, who's the United Kingdom's foremost jurist and legal scholar on terrorism and counterterrorism, and one of my heroes, uh, Lord Campbell, um, former Olympian, who for over a decade had held the 100 meters um, uh, dash record in the United Kingdom, current chancellor of the University of St. Andrews, longtime uh, member of parliament for Fife, uh, the um, county where St. Andrews is, 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 is located and the former leader of the, um, of, of the Liberal Democratic Party. So we're enormously fortunate to have them as well. So thank you all for coming. I think this promises to be an enormously interesting and very rich conference. I left out that we also have a panel on terrorism leadership, which is something we hadn't had in the past. And that's late tomorrow afternoon, so I hope you'll stick around. And let me now turn it over to my friend and colleague, Tim Wilson. Thanks very much, Bruce, for those um, extremely warm 
words of welcome. I did hesitate for a moment as to whether you were actually going to out yourself as the founder of CSTPV along with Paul Wilkinson or not. I'm glad you did, because uh, I would have had to if you had not. Um, this is a very special period for us. Uh, I think that many terrorism study centers kind of suffer an attrition rate not much slower than that of terrorist groups themselves. Uh, they come and go. Somehow we have survived, but it's not, of course, by accident. I think it's a tribute to the wisdom and far-sightedness of uh, Bruce Hoffman and Paul Wilkinson back in August 1994. Those of you who know anything about Northern Ireland will think provisional IRA ceasefire. Uh, a time when conventional wisdom was not focused on uh, the terrorist threat at all. It was a time when, despite the horrors in Bosnia and Rwanda, in terms of terrorism, it was a period of some optimism. South Africa had a peace process. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland had a peace process. Even, amazing to recall, Israel-Palestine had a peace process that looked like it was going somewhere. And for many people, terrorism looked like uh, yesterday's business, sort of unfinished detritus from the Cold War. Bruce and Paul took a very different view, and obviously I'm delighted that they did, because that is the legacy that we and my predecessors have been building on ever since. Uh, slightly sobering to hear this is the fourth such conference in a few years. Definitely our turn to host you, Bruce, next time. Um, but it is, quite sincerely, a huge honor to be partnered with CSS as the sort of premier such uh, program in the United States. My predecessor, Richard English, who we're fortunate enough to have as part of the St. Andrews team, um, used to say, I thought, a very striking observation that if you looked at reading lists on terrorism in British universities and American universities, there was often surprisingly little overlap, you know, a kind of classic case of Churchill's divided by a common language. And I think this relationship that uh, CSTPV and St. Andrews and CSS and Georgetown has is a kind of shining anomaly and a, a sort of countercurrent that is much needed and that uh, our dialogue is richer for being genuinely transatlantic. And I hope that may long continue. Bruce has already outlined some of the uh, richness and diversity of the program on offer, so I'll not linger on that. But I say I think there is much here to illuminate, provoke, uh, and if it doesn't sound too flippant, hopefully also entertain in our discussions. And I say I thank Georgetown most sincerely for giving us this chance. Thank you. speak for? How, how, how long do you want to speak for? 10, 15, 20? 20. 20. 20. Same with you? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, the scene has well and truly been set in, in the last uh, moment or two. We now move to the conference proper, as it were, and <clears throat> our first uh, two speakers uh, are on the uh, program. Um, uh, Dr. Lair and Dr. Buchanan, um, um, happily from the point of view of the chair, uh, there's a document which sets out in detail their quite remarkable biographies, so I don't need to read uh, all of that in detail, but I will set the scene very uh, slightly by saying that Dr. Buchanan is a an assistant uh, teaching professor in the School of Foreign Service and a senior faculty fellow at the, <coughs> excuse me, at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, both at Georgetown University. He conducts research on the intersection of technology and statecraft, and that is to some extent foreshadowed by the title of this section of our conference. He has a PhD from uh, King's College London, where he was a Marshall Scholar and has both master's and undergraduate degrees from Georgetown University. Uh, Dr. Lair uh, joined the CSTPV in September 2004. He previously taught political science uh, at uh, the University of Heidelberg, where he took his uh, master's degree and his doctorate. And he is a regional expert on the Indo-Pacific, with a particular interest in maritime terrorism and piracy. Our two speakers 
Uh, we'll speak for approximately 15 to 20 minutes, after which we will be open to questions. Um, <clears throat> the chair will uh, welcome succinct questions and even succinct comment, uh, but not speeches. There will be roving microphones, so if I identify you, I hope you'll wait until you get the microphone in front of you. The other thing is, since this is being recorded for posterity, the lights are very bright, and up at this end of the room, it's quite difficult to see everything. So if I'm not uh, <coughs> properly catching your attention, then don't feel inhibited about shouting out in the most polite Georgetown or St. Andrews University way. Um, to begin then, I think we'll have uh, Dr. Buchanan. Over sure. to you. And the speeches will be made from the podium, and we'll have oh. the question and answer back at the table. Thank you very much. I uh, echo uh, the thanks that, that have been expressed. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here, especially as someone who is not uh, in his day job a terrorism specialist. I feel like in many respects I can, can learn more than I can give, but I'm here to talk about the intersection of technology and terrorism, and in particular about uh, technology of artificial intelligence. I, for, for reasons I think I'll elaborate a little bit, but not too much on, I think there's good evidence to believe that this is in many respects, the technological uh, revolution of our time. It will affect many different aspects of national security policy, many different aspects of economic policy. And at a conference like this, on a day like this, it's important to ask, what will artificial intelligence mean for the business of counterterrorism? Before I try to address a little bit of that question, I think it's worth taking a step back and asking, what is artificial intelligence? Why am I convinced it is a technological revolution of our time. To explain artificial intelligence, I often uh, distill a concept that I call the AI triad, which essentially is the three components that make artificial intelligence so powerful and so important. And these three components are algorithms, data, and computing power. And you can distill artificial intelligence uh, in one sentence using these three components, which is that artificial intelligence is an algorithm that learns from data using computing power. And what's striking about this sentence is that it is actually the inverse, and the algorithms of AI are the inverse of virtually the entire history of computer science that came before, in which machines did not learn, machines were told. We gave computers instructions on what they had to do, and they did them blindingly and without hesitation. In the world of artificial intelligence or the world of machine learning, we have inverted this paradigm. We give computers data, we give them an algorithm that tells them how to learn, we give them computing power so that they can do it, and they go off and learn from data. And what they conclude and how they conclude it is often quite literally a mystery to us. They are very good at getting the right answers from this data, and they are very bad at telling us how they got those answers, a theme we'll return to in a couple of minutes. To pause a little bit more uh, on each of these three parts of the triad, I think I should make the case as to why uh, this is such an important technology for today and for why it could change uh, the business of counterterrorism. On the algorithm side, we have seen tremendous innovation in what these algorithms can do and what they can learn. I will give one example, a company called DeepMind, Google's leading AI research lab in 2016, uh, defeated using a machine learning algorithm, the world champion at Go, for those of you who don't know Go, it's an ancient board game. It goes back around three or 4,000 years. And what's remarkable about Go is how complex it is. Some of us might remember the defeat uh, by a system called Deep Blue, which was not a machine learning system, of Garry Kasparov in 1997 at chess. Go is far more complex than chess. There are more possible combinations on the Go board than there are atoms in the universe. In fact, there are more possible combinations on the Go board than total atoms if every atom in our universe had an entire universe of atoms contained within it. To put it simply, you cannot calculate in Go. You must intuit the right move. You must feel the right move. And up until 2016, we thought, and with good reason, that this notion of intuition and feel and sense was a distinctly human property. And I think what 2016 taught us is that algorithms, as alarming as it might be, can intuit and feel better than the best humans on Earth in that regard. 
And this, I think, shows the power of algorithms. There are many other examples we can talk about in the Q&A. When it comes to data, what's remarkable is how data-centric uh, virtually everything in our society is today. Certainly, the business of counterterrorism is no exception. There was a study from IBM in 2018 that 90% of the world's data had been created in the previous two years. It is a cliche to say that we are living in the age of big data, but it is also true. And what's remarkable about machine learning systems is that they can process this data at a scale that was hitherto virtually impossible. So they can hoover up every scrap of information, distill it for its most important patterns, and then use that in service of their goals. And one of the questions I think we can ask when we think about machine learning and counterterrorism is how can we use machine learning to analyze counterterrorism data to make predictions and to work retrospectively uh, to find people who have committed terrorist acts. And when we turn to computing power, um, this is, I think, something that's, that's not quite intuitive to those of us who live in a society where computers are essentially commodities. Almost none of us know the computing power of our smartphones or our laptops. That is simply not what we look to when we buy these devices anymore. In the world of artificial intelligence, computing power is not a commodity. It matters quite a bit and it drives many of the outcomes that we see, even more than algorithms or data. I'll give you one stat to illustrate this point. Many of you may have heard of Moore's Law, a trend that goes for five or six decades, predicting the growth in computing power. It, Moore's Law predicts that every 24 months, the computing power will double. Between 2012 and 2018, depending on how you count, traditional Moore's Law would, inc would uh, predict an increase in computing power something like 18 to 24 times. And in regular computers, that is basically what we have seen in our smartphones and in our laptops. In computing power applied to machine learning, we have seen, again, something that is not, not at all short of a revolution. Between 2012 and 2018, computing power for machine learning increased by a factor of 300,000 times. To put that in more relatable terms, if your cell phone battery lasted one day in 2012 and its storage capacity increased at the same rate that computing for AI has increased, it would now last 800 years. That has not happened. So the net effect of this is I make this pitch to you that we have this incredibly powerful technology that in many respects has emerged in the last seven or eight years, largely without many of us knowing, and the question before us is, what does this technology mean for counterterrorism? If it's so powerful, if it's so good, if it's the revolution that I believe it might be, shouldn't it change counterterrorism? And the answer, as academics often say, is yes and no. There are two main applications of AI to counterterrorism. The first is AI as a tool of internet moderation, where it gets a lot of hype. The second is AI as a tool of intelligence, where it does not get a lot of hype. My view is that the hype is misplaced. It should not be on in internet moderation. It should be on intelligence. And I'll tell you why. AI is at the center of internet moderation. And by internet moderation, I mean the challenge uh, faced by Facebook and others to control what is on their platforms. To say at a scale of 2 billion users, can they quickly and effectively find terrorist content and take it offline? Can they find efforts at radicalization and take them offline? The problem is across the scale of 2 billion users, it is virtually impossible for humans to do that. It will only be reactive waiting for a user to report such content. The promise of artificial intelligence is that it could learn from data, it could learn from what's been reported in the past, and it could quickly and effectively find this uh, malicious content and take it offline. And this is something that Facebook is very bullish on, not just in the counterterrorism context, but in the uh, other violations of their terms of service, including hate speech and the like. So the good news about AI is that it really does scale across the, something as big as the Facebook platform. Facebook uses AI to run its platform. It uses AI to target its ads. And we know AI can scale to this giant, giant network. The bad news is that AI fails at some of, the some of the tasks that are intrinsic to internet moderation. It often fails to understand context in a way that human can, humans can. For example, the same video of a terrorist activity might in one context be a recruiting video, but in the other context be a legitimate news video. And if the algorithm cannot grasp that context, 
it will be unlikely to succeed in taking that video offline in the terrorist context and keeping it online in the context of BBC News or appropriate news. AI often fails in new scenarios. Facebook um, had a spectacularly difficult time, along with other platforms like Twitter, in taking down the live streams and the videos of the terrible shooting in Christchurch. It had not anticipated the possibility that someone would live stream a terrorist activity as it was happening and that it would be so quickly rebroadcast by so many users around the world. And the AI systems, the moderation systems that Facebook had uh, were, were not sufficient to take that video offline and stop it from going viral. And what's important in that respect, and more generally in the internet moderation context, is that partial success is not good enough. Uh, if my students get nine qu questions out of 10 on an exam, they probably get a 90%. In the current terrorism internet moderation business, if you take down nine videos out of 10, or 900 videos out of 1,000, you don't get a 90%, you get an F, because it's those remaining videos that will go viral. So AI has this problem that it not only must be successful in most of the cases, it really has to be successful in all of the cases. And what we saw with the Christchurch incident is that many of the videos were taken down uh, promptly, but the ones that were not taken down continued to go viral and continued to spread. And I think there's some evidence that AI continues to fail in practice, that the systems we have right now for internet moderation are not as good as we would like. Facebook claims a 99% success rate. I think this is some fuzzy math. Um, more independent studies, one by the Associated Press, suggests that it's a, closer to a 30 or 40% success rate, that a lot of the terrorist content that is posted on platforms eludes, for the reasons I mentioned before, uh, internet moderation systems that are automated, and this is a problem that persists. The last point on internet moderation is that we don't get an explanation. As I said at the outset, artificial intelligence systems are very good at getting to the right answer, though not perfect, and very bad at explaining how they got there. And the challenge that Facebook faces with its <laughs> deployment of artificial intelligence for internet moderation is a challenge we face with artificial intelligence in so many other contexts. We don't get an explanation as to why particular content is banned, or at least we don't always get an explanation that is fully satisfactory. And one of the broader questions we have to consider is are we comfortable with internet moderation that relies so heavily on artificial intelligence that is in many respects a black box? So while I think there's a lot of hype at the intersection of technology and counterterrorism in the internet moderation business, I think a lot of that hype is misplaced. As I said at the outset, that hype probably should go to the business of AI and intelligence and conventional counterterrorism analysis of signals intelligence and the like. There is extremely strong applications of AI in the places of intelligence where the data is well structured. I'm thinking in particular here of signals intelligence systems, which often gather far more data than can be analyzed. And it is a core part of modern signals intelligence to use computer systems to do a first or second or third pass on this data in order to extract the relevant insights. And I think it's fair to say that many of these systems thus far are not benefiting from machine learning, and many would. And you can imagine other kinds of intelligence, for example, overhead imagery intelligence, that would meet the same criteria where we've got a lot of data, it's comparatively well-structured, we could use machine learning systems to learn from that data. That said, there are a number of privacy and ethical concerns that come with this application, and I think we, we should wonder um, the degree to which a computer looking at data is meaningfully different than a human looking at data, and what that means for privacy uh, and Fourth Amendment rights in the United States. I'm not here to offer answers to those questions, only to suggest that I'm speaking of the technical application of AI to intelligence, and there's a whole world of the legal and ethical application of AI to intelligence. I do think AI is probably less suitable to human intelligence, where the data is less well-structured, less voluminous, and perhaps in the business of counterterrorism, more important. And we will have to think about how, if at all, to apply AI to that context, or how, as is so often the case in the intelligence world, to integrate uh, singles intelligence, overhead intelligence, and more traditional human intelligence. AI could scramble that calculus, but that is no reason, in my view, for not including it. We simply will get better at intelligence if we can extract the insights in the data that we already have. I close with two questions about intelligence and artificial intelligence. 
uh, questions that are meant to suggest that there is much that is there, but there are also many non-technical questions that people in the intelligence world should work through before deploying AI to the business of counterterrorism. The first question is, yet again, to what degree do we need an explanation? If artificial intelligence is this black box, where is it appropriate to deploy it in counterterrorism and intelligence? Where is it appropriate to say, we are confident in this conclusion even though we don't know why? And where is it appropriate to say, that is not sufficient? Uh, there's often the example posed, would you be willing to target drone strikes on the basis of a machine learning system? Or would you be willing to use other counterterrorism levers on the basis of analysis from a machine learning system? And would your answer change if you could be shown empirically, and this is purely hypothetical, that the machine learning system was better than the human process that would otherwise be used? And to what degree is an explanation at the core of our ethical use of technology and our ethical practice of counterterrorism? I pose that only as a question and as a hypothetical. I suspect if we integrate AI into the intelligence business, we will find it to be more than just a hypothetical. And lastly, the question is one of bureaucratic integration and organization. To what degree must we change our bureaucracy, must we change our practice of counterterrorism on a daily basis in order to accomplish the integration of artificial intelligence? This is in many respects the single most important question, perhaps aside from some of the ethical ones, when it comes to AI and counterterrorism. We have built, especially in the last 19 years, but indeed before that, a counterterrorism apparatus that is pretty good at functioning in the way it functions, but is probably less good at functioning in a different way and is uh, slow to adapt to technological change. We have trained analysts, we have trained case officers to work in one particular way. Technology is always disruptive. As I said at the outset, I think AI is poised to be particularly disruptive. And that is true in particular when it comes to our organizations. It is very easy for intelligence leadership to say, we want to integrate AI into our singles intelligence analysis. We want to integrate AI into our geospatial intelligence analysis. It is very hard to push that change down to the analyst and case officer level. But if we are to integrate AI into counterterrorism, my argument is that it is essential. Once again, I do not have answers to this question. I merely pose it. And I pose it to conclude on a notion of cutting through the hype. For as important as I believe artificial intelligence will be to society, and in some respects to the business of counterterrorism, I think we should not delude ourselves that it will put any of us, especially those of you working on counterterrorism, out of a job. Um, for as much power as this technology has, my belief is that counterterrorism is fundamentally an enterprise that will, even in the future, continue to be human. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, well, a great deal to digest in that, and I hope we'll have some penetrating questions as a result. Uh, and now, Dr. Lehrer. Dr. Lehrer, beg your pardon. All right, good morning, everybody. And thanks, Chancellor, for the introduction, and thanks, Bruce, for having me here. The last time I was in DC, George W. was, already, was still president. I think that's a wee while ago. Nothing much has changed, as I saw yesterday. But, uh, well, that's my opinion, just. Right, I have been introduced as a specialist in maritime terrorism and piracy. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm also a specialist on militant Buddhism. It's also not what I'm talking about today. Uh, today, I want to talk a bit about terrorism and technology, and actually step a bit back from uh, what Ben already talked about uh, to ask some very broad questions in the hope that uh, it will be thought-provoking for you and that you will come up with your own opinion. It's early in the morning still, at least for me. Uh, there are many talks, so I thought maybe just a warm-up uh, warm act for you uh, to form your own opinion. So normally I'm teaching critical infrastructure protection in St. Andrews, hence basically uh, this technology thing that I'm doing. And the question that I quite often get asked, well, what can technology do for us to defend us against terrorism? Well, that's basically one of the broad questions I want to ask and discuss. And again, I don't have answers. I have even more questions than Ben. And the second question is uh, that I want to ask, and actually even more important one, in my opinion, what could do technology to us? How could it impact on our societies? How could it change us? Uh, as uh, Ben already mentioned, there are some ethical 
problems uh, uh, with technology. There are some privacy options, uh, problems with technology. And that's basically what I want to talk about. And in the end, I finish with a very strong opinion like, gee, I don't really know. Uh, it probably depends. It all depends is something that uh, is what I'm saying most often to my students. It all depends maybe where I come from, all this stuff. And so basically, again, it all depends on the magnitude of the threat you face on the most recent attack that we have faced. And uh, well, let's get there. So first of all, there are some assumptions behind what technology could do for us. And there was an interesting article uh, from uh, Mills and Huber uh, immediately after 9-11 in 2002, uh, where they came up with some very strong opinions about uh, what technology could do to us or for us. And they say actually in the post-September 11 world, we know we have to see the plastic explosives in the truck before they detonate, the anthrax before it's dispersed, uh, the serene nerve gas before it gets into the air conditioning duct and not just see it, but recognize it and in bulk and in real time. I agree with that and I think it would be even better if we could uh, get one step ahead of them and nip the terrorist uh, event in the butt. Basically actually strike preemptively before they are ready actually to ship uh, a truckload of explosives into our inner cities before they actually are prepared to uh, disperse serene gas basically. So this is what we would need to do. A second they say probably deployed at home as they can be. These technologies of freedom uh, will guarantee the physical security of which our civil liberties uh, ultimately depend probably deployed, deployed abroad, they will destroy privacy everywhere where it needs uh, to be destroyed. And now I think, that's my point, uh, privacy is destroyed everywhere, not, even, not only abroad, but at home as well. And that's basically what technology could do to us. And finally, they say it's only, it's only our technology that will, be, that will let us survive this war on terrorism, that will actually let us win. And they say actually uh, in the war uh, of their bodies against our silicone, it's our silicone that will win. Very strong opinions and I think on the one hand actually they are not wrong. Uh, Ben mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning, all this stuff, and I think that's where it starts, actually. That's a kind of back office that's not very visible normally to normal people that will help us actually nipping the terrorist uh, event in the butt. Uh, we are computer systems that trail lots of different databases, uh, uh, all the big data and all the stuff that our mobile phone gives, basically when we move to cities, basically where is this person, who is he talking with, when and how, what he's up to, basically. And machine learning plays a very big role in that, as uh, Sir Andrew Parker said, the current director of MI5, uh, uh, the next step is to use machine learning to extract useful intelligence from this vast quantity information. Mind you, we are looking for a needle in a haystack, uh, actually a needle in many haystacks, and we are not really sure whether there are actually any needles to be detect detected. So we need actually a fairly straightforward machine learning process and that helps sift to vast information to see whether there is something. Sometimes there is simply no needle. And remember in Germany, the, the German intelligence service went uh, to uh, chase uh, some Salafi terrorists uh, and went to lots of databases. They didn't find anybody. Uh, so uh, it doesn't always work, but the idea is actually good. And I think the ultimate aim here is predict predictive policing. Think of the uh, Hollywood blockbuster Minority Report. And that's basically where we might go to, actually knowing what they do before they know it themselves. And I think with regard to protecting our societies, and I'm not yet talking about civil liberties issues, that would be actually the holy grail. Being able to look into their mind with our technology, and in a couple of years' time, we might be actually able to do that in real time in predictive policing or not only basically post-dictive after the event. Now there's a second step actually involved and that's uh, if you really want to nip a terrorist event in the butt, you need to be able to correctly identify people, uh, suspected terrorists or known terrorists. Uh, and this is where biometric, smart CCTV and augmented reality comes into play. You know from airports to other high security areas, uh, and that you need uh, to uh, actually present your credentials in form of biometrics, uh, facial recognition, sometimes iris recognition, uh, thumbprints and all the stuff. Actually, I went to uh, immigration two days ago without all that stuff. Uh, as a fuddy-duddy old gentleman, I but obviously not a threat or whatever. But normally this is what happens and uh, it helps you also basically to filter out some other evildoers who might not necessarily be terrorists, uh, uh, but travel uh, with forged passports. Uh, 
My friends uh, from Suvanabhumi Airport in Bangkok uh, have also rolled out uh, this kind of biometrics and it's quite amazing how many people are traveling on passport that's not really theirs. Uh, so basically that helps us actually uh, to be um, more secure. Now, of course, it would be even better if you can identify people when they are moving to your cities. And this is basically where something like facial recognition or gate recognition comes into play. Facial recognition, well, that's something uh, you don't need to volunteer. People can look at your faces, cameras can actually look at your face and identify that. At the moment in Germany, I don't know whether it's here the case, uh, but uh, this American startup firm uh, Clear Vision is discussed very controversially in Germany or the European Union with uh, their millions of pictures and databases and all the stuff, where people as pictures or faces actually get downloaded from Facebook, other social medias and all the stuff without them knowing. Uh, so basically in the end you are suspect, you're basically guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. And that's of course a fallout of that, but still basically form a kind of counterterrorism policing and this is quite important. People moving to the city, CCTVs are gazing down on you, can actually home in your face with video or analytical uh, software behind that and actually identify you and say, right, okay, we need to actually lead police officers to that person, intercept that person before uh, he's ready to do something wrong. There's one step further, not only CCTV, but also augmented reality classes. You remember Google Class a couple of years ago? And this is something that's a thing again. And there are a couple of Chinese police service already who are actually getting this uh, kind of classes there. You actually look at some person, you actually can snap a picture of that person, upload this picture immediately to a database and get some matches and then you get basically information played on your on your lens whether this person whether there's anything against that person or not and you can basically uh, intercept that person and before uh, uh, something is uh, something can be done. And uh, actually uh, one BBC journalist made an experiment a couple of years ago, John Sutworth in, uh, in, in 2017, in, in 17 in the city of Guyan. He actually volunteered his mugshot uh, for the database and then uh, he went and taxi in a random part of the city and walked and simply walked and within seven minutes the police actually swooped and arrested him. I mean, he was released later on, I assume. Uh, but basically, just to see how quick it works if you have enough CCTV systems. So it works like a charm, I can tell you. And that's the future, basically. Google glasses and facial recognition systems and all the stuff. And that would be, with regard to counterterrorism and policing, uh, be quite a nice way forward. Now, since you mentioned uh, uh, Paul Wilkinson, one of the founding fathers of CCTV, uh, it doesn't always work your way. Uh, as he said, basically as a counter specialist, you're always rem uh, remembered like a, a famous goalkeeper. Uh, people don't remember you for your thousands of brilliant saves, only for the one that got behind you. Uh, so some terrorists, like the IA said, got lucky uh, and they simply evade our identification biometrics. They simply walk to the city. So the next step would be having detecting systems, explosive sniffers and all the stuff, and that can actually see what they have on their bodies so, and their backpacks and all the stuff. Again, uh, airports are these test beds, you know, metal scanners, uh, full body scanners that were controversial in their first iteration because uh, as some said that was akin to a virtual strip search because there was this nice grayscale body uh, picture of your naked body to which I then once said to Radio Television Ireland uh, before I fly I hit the trim again. Uh, with inventions. But nowadays you have this kind of mad stick persona uh, which doesn't reveal anything, just basically flagging up things uh, uh, where there's something on your body that needs to, to get checked. It takes time. Uh, it cannot be rolled out outside of an airport, say in a busy railway station or metro station or something like that. But that's basically the future of policing. Since I mentioned the blockbuster, think of Total Recall, the old one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he goes to this security system of the metro and he gets bombarded with these millimeter waves uh, from all directions and uh, his naked body is scanned, there's nothing on it. And that's also what he, Mills and Huber said, basically we need to detect in real time. And uh, mark my words, that will happen uh, sooner or later because there are many startup firms actually working on that. There's a third layer, but the third layer then is just about threat mitigation. Uh, that's low tech, that's all these uh, stainless steel bollards uh, and uh, blender boxes. Uh, and uh, horrible things that double up as art in front of buildings, but actually meant to keep drugs from being driven into that and all that stuff. Uh, but again, that's basically low tech and it's not about detecting any longer, it's keeping, let's be very blunt, the body count down. But in the end, basically, our technology can do amazing things to make our society more secure. No doubt about that. However, and now I come to the other part, uh, to uh, this, this kind of antithesis, technology won't save us. Technology can be outwitted. 
technology can also be used against us by the terrorists. And technologies, of course, leads to quite a lot of infringements of civil liberties and human rights and in a trade-off base. You can get more secure, but you are less liberal. And that, in my opinion, is the biggest problem. Let's start with the outwitting. Uh, think of aviation terrorism. Think of Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, still the most sophisticated outfits that Al-Qaeda has and very keen in defeating our defenses to still blow up an airliner. Uh, think of the liquid bomb plot, the first one in 1995. Ramzi Yusuf, now in a high security or supermax in the United States, and rightly so, uh, that was defeated. The bomb worked, by the way. One Japanese passenger got killed in a test explosion. The second was then the shoe bomber. Remember December 2001? Explosives hidden in a shoe. Uh, the third iteration was yet another liquid bomb plot, the transatlantic airliner plot. And the bottles looked basically like untempered bottles of Gatorade. And it was basically uh, intelligence work, human intelligence, not much uh, computer stuff, that helped the police and intelligence service in the United Kingdom to actually intercept, uh, to actually swoop down on them before they were at the strike. But they didn't give up. Uh, the next was the underwear bomb in December 2009. And again, the person actually got on board of the plane and he was subdued by the passengers and the cabin crew. Uh, because it's not normal that you ignite your underwear on flight, but it was a clever idea uh, to blow up an airliner. And the charge would have been enough, basically, uh, to, blow, uh, to punch a hole in the fuselage, and the, the differences of pressure inside and outside would have been enough, basically, uh, to uh, explode this flight. And the next talk was then cavity bombs. Is that a really thing? Uh, surgically implanted bombs, uh, breast implants, or love handles, or something like that. I wonder, I'm not a specialist in explosives, uh, but if there are drug mules that can swallow condoms filled with uh, cocaine or whatever, can you do that with explosives? It hasn't happened so far, and I hope it will not happen, but you see basically that they are trying actually to innovate as quickly as they can to defeat our defenses. So technology can be outfitted, it can be used against us as well. And then there's the dual use. Uh, Lots of things could be, thought, uh, could be said about that. Just think of drones. Uh, London Gatwick Airport was closed for hours for a couple of days just because some people were flying drones in the flight path of planes. Uh, think of uh, Venezuelan President Maduro who was attacked by a, a drone loaded with explosives in 2018. So this is basically technology off the shelf that terrorists could use against us as well uh, to, uh, to outwit us. But the biggest thing, in my opinion, is basically the attack on our civil liberties and our human rights. So we've mentioned machine learning, artificial intelligence and data mining and all that stuff. And I found an interesting quote from Karl Chakia, who said uh, on the Pentagon's optical nerve program that the outcome was poor Kafka, with innocent people being caught in a surveillance dragnet. In fact, in attempting to find faces, the Pentagon's optic nerve program recorded webcam sex by the unknowing targets. Right, gee, uh, I was talking with somebody from GCHQ, that's basically the United Kingdom intelligence service uh, uh, doing that, and they told me uh, really well, they don't have enough manpower staff basically uh, to go you all to Facebook pictures that you upload. I'm not so sure any longer. Uh, not somebody snickering on my last uh, kind of uh, out of kilter pictures of the Washington Monument or something like that. But still, basically, there is a kind of trend towards social cooling nowadays. It's not only about what the government does, it's also what others do. Facebook, that you've mentioned, uh, Google, Twitter, or whatever, using your intelligence. Uh, well, in, in the best way, basically, to get your targeted uh, advertisement. I got, uh, for a couple of years, a uh, funeral insurance uh, uh, tar uh, advertisement. It stopped now, and I wonder what Facebook knows about me that I don't know. But basically, what people now are very careful not to reveal too much about themselves, because as soon as you put it out there, as soon as you upload it, it's gone for you. You can never actually get it back. And that's a bit, uh, a, a bit of a pity, so to speak. The good chief privacy has sailed, in my opinion, and that's a kind of modern times, not only about counterterrorism technology, it's the relentless march of technology as you know it. And yes, it makes it easier for you. Your phone tells you where you are. Your phone might give you an idea about restaurants and all that stuff. It's very helpful. Would you trade off a little bit of your privacy by using them? There's another problem that you have, and that's a city life and public spaces. Public spaces get less and less open and more and more confined. Uh, many uh, 
places where you used, used to simply go in, where you nowadays need actually to go to metal scanners and all that stuff. Now take a look at the museums here, Smithsonian museums or so. There were two of them actually where I had to go to metal scanners uh, and, uh, to get into uh, the Space and Aviation Museum, for example. And uh, that is a bit... Uh, it's a strange feeling, isn't it? I mean, you, you get used to it, uh, but for me it's still a strange feeling. Also for me as a German, basically, having CCTV cameras looking at each my, my move, St. Andrews, for example, as soon as you get out of the bus station, there are cameras looking at you. You go to the town, cameras are looking at you. And actually recently in the building, arts faculty building, uh, the security response came late in the evening because they saw somebody on the CCTV system downstairs in the, in the foyer. I didn't even know there's a CCTV system, now I know. Uh, so basically it might make you a bit more secure, but everybody knows where you are. Oh, Dr. Lee is working late again tonight and all that stuff. It may be a good thing for the university, but basically your privacy is gone, so to speak. Also go to parts of Washington where there were public spaces and now basically cordoned off and all that stuff. And that changes basically imperceptibly uh, cities and societies. Also the new architecture that you have, making that basically bomb-proof, uh, the new uh, 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 World Trade Center 1, for, ex for example, looks like fortresses, basically. It takes basically the ease of life away ever so gradually. But this is still not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the securitization of every, everyday life. And I found uh, uh, an interesting quote uh, from Shabtai Shavit, uh, at that time uh, the chief of Mossad, who said, well, given the choice between being less democratic and surviving and dying democratically, I prefer the first option. And he said then, Miss Thatcher uh, said that in order to protect democracy, you sometimes have to have no choice but to use undemocratic means. And do you agree with that? I'm not really sure. I think it depends on the magnitude of the threat. And one of my colleagues, uh, political scientist Malcolm Anderson, called it the politics of the latest outrage. Something happens and then the public and uh, the media clamors for something to be done. Uh, new laws to be passed, uh, more severe laws and all that. And I do remember the day after 9-11, a long time ago now, our then time for a Minister for Domestic Affairs, Germany, uh, Otto Schiele, was sitting very calmly in a, in, a, in a TV studio and telling people that now security parcel number one needs to be actually uh, to, to, uh, to be put to parliament very quickly because now the threat is very, very huge. And nobody can tell me that his minions were cobbling that together in 24 or 4 hours after the events. That was already there, basically waiting for the right time. But that's just suspicious me, so to speak. So be very careful. Uh, when you adopt technology without actually criticizing or questioning what could happen to you, because then you run the danger of getting it out of kilter. And uh, I found an interesting quote of a, of a British journalist, Hugo Rifkind, uh, who said after this Cambridge Analytica story that we are here thanks to an uh, unwitting alliance between politicians and pundits who didn't understand enough technology to grasp what was happening out there, and technological innovators who didn't understand enough politics to grasp why this was a problem. So basically there's a kind of a, a missing link between what the innovators can do and what politicians can understand. We chatted about elder generation and belong to that now as well. I'm not good, I don't even know what hashtags mean and all that stuff. So if you take a look at members of parliament, uh, congress or whatever, I suspect that might be the, the same thing. I'm not really sure. And in the end, uh, Big Brothers, uh, surveillance state and all this stuff, uh, I'm less concerned, I must say, about governments. I'm less concerned about NSA, CIA, uh, GCHQ, MI5 or whatever. I'm more concerned about all the little firms whose names I've never heard. Uh, Clear Vision, for example, never heard that before. What are they doing with your data? And now, at the moment, you have this, this trend towards a lean state, which means the state is getting ever smaller, and lots of things that used to be basically the prerogative of the state are outsourced. Forensic policing, jails, and all that stuff. Or so. so you end up with lots of little big brothers, uh, Facebook, Google, and all that stuff. And uh, So big brother doesn't exist. Orwell doesn't exist. You have many small little big brothers. And then don't think that surveillance is kind of an oppressive thing. Think about the social credit system in China. Uh, that's a kind of an app-like feature nowadays. You can play, you can game. If you're a really good citizen, you get boons, you get benefits, you get a mortgage without security, you get preferential seating in your restaurant, uh, you can get high-speed trains, flights, you can travel internationally. 
And the people actually, young generation in China, they are actually flaunting their high social credit on Sina Weibo, their Facebook, basically, how great citizens they are. So you actually, you actually profit from being a good citizen. But what happens if for one reason or another you are not a good citizen? What happens if you question the state? What happens if you're a dissident? Uh, your social credit system goes from a nice green into a bright red. Your passport gets taken away. Uh, police will actually uh, uh, monitor each and every of your step. There are no high speed trains any longer. Forget about travel and all that stuff, you don't have it. And if you belong to an ethnic minority, I mean, as a dissident, you can simply shut up. But as if you belong to an ethnic minority, the Uyghurs, for example, flaunting a beard and being a, a devout Muslim or whatever, there's nothing you can do. Uh, to actually protect yourself against this overbearing state. And this is something that might happen, and maybe you might think I'm away with the fairies here, and that will happen to us as well if you're not very careful. We start as liberal democracies, and if we actually want to defend ourselves against terrorism or against any serious threat, we, I, we might end up as something else, as illiberal democracies. And since I'm in Washington, I thought maybe ending up with some quotes of uh, some of your big names, James Madison and Benjamin Franklin. And uh, Madison said in 1798, uh, perhaps it's universal truth that a loss of liberty at home is to be charged to provisions against danger, real or pretended, from abroad. And uh, Benjamin Franklin, and you know all these quotes, said, well, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I do agree, but in the end it all depends, as I said, on the magnitude of the threat. I wonder what Madison and Franklin would have said in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, or in London 7-7 for that matter. Would they have stuck to their lofty aims and objectives, or would they have said, oh, okay, right, we need to do something. There's this, there's this universal fight between universalists in government, like ultimate truths that also belong to evildoers, terrorists, or whatever, and utilitarians who are more caring for the greater good of the greater part of the population, which also means there's a smaller part of the population and that uh, might have to bring uh, uh, um, sacrifices. So I'm not really sure. I'm flip-flopping all the time, which is basically what I try to do here anyway. Uh, and I think over to you. What do you think, basically? Uh, technology can do a lot for us. It can do a lot to us. Is it worse, actually, uh, to uh, be adapted anyway? And then again, basically, uh, this ship has sailed, so to speak. Uh, with this relentless march of technology, is it maybe a bit too naive to think, well, now that it's out there, we simply will not use it? Uh, I think that's possibly also uh, something that I want to get out to you. So make up your mind, uh, convince me, and uh, tell me what to think about that so that I can go back home and tell my students something new then. Thanks for listening and looking forward to your questions. Uh, well, it would be wrong to say my confidence has been undermined by these two last two contributions. But I came uh, seeking certainty and uh, I don't think it's available. And in that I imply no criticism of, uh, of our two contributors. All the way through I was thinking, well, pity the poor politicians, uh, because it's them who get presented with the dilemma of the technology suggests that a major incident is about to take place, but in order, I'm painting a rather fanciful picture, but in order to deal with this incident, uh, we will have to ride roughshod over the civil liberties of the whole of the population uh, of the District of Columbia. Politicians have got to make these decisions. Um, and uh, increasingly, it seems to me, that the more complex the technology, then the more complex the decision making. And the one thing, of course, that the technology does is to squeeze time. So you're being asked to make more difficult decisions in a much shorter period. We might come back and uh, investigate that. And one, uh, I hope you forgive me, but I was thinking during both of your contributions of that famous definition of the metaphysician, who was uh, defined as being a blind man in a blindfold in a darkened room looking for a black cat that isn't there. Uh, in the search for a truth, if you like, uh, which it is thought uh, would certainly revolutionize thought. However, enough from me. As I say, there are roving microphones. Who would like to start? Yes, microphone's coming. 
it's a keep fit uh, program too for the operators. Thank you very much. Richard English, Queen's University Belfast, formerly of St Andrews. Two excellent presentations. I've got one comment briefly and then a question for Ben. The comment is in both of what you were saying. It struck me repeatedly there were continuities between where we are now and some of the things that in previous generations would have been commented on. So the importance of the human understanding of context and intuition about it, the tension between safety and liberty, the rewards there are technologically for people making the kit that Peter mentioned, startup firms and so on, uh, and also the vital importance of keeping in proportion the threat so we keep in proportion the response. So in all of those, as an historian, I was encouraged that there seemed to be continuities rather than just fault lines in this, and I, I suspect you're both going to agree with that. My question was for Ben on the basis of the, the hypothetical you raised about what if AI turns out to be better at humans, at things like which which reaper to use against which van, and that kind of question. I suppose my question for you is this. If terrorist behavior is to be interpreted and counter-terrorist policy is to be interpreted as representing a normal thing that we do, in other words, if we treat terrorists as humans and counter-terrorists as facing similar kinds of challenge, is it the case that that kind of AI dilemma with counter-terrorism is broadly analogous to the sorts of dilemma we'll face, for example, when, as seems the case, surgery might well be better done by a robot than by a human surgeon because some people still have the anxiety that if you're going in there and there's not a human there's a robot it's somehow worse but if the statistics are you can have better chance of your heart operation going well if it's the robot is that a is, is it a qualitatively different problem because it's terrorism or is it basically mm. the same problem with ai if it's the surgery or the drone strike that's my question to you well it is a terrific question uh, such a good question that I, I posed a very similar one on my midterm exam um, which is to say to students in artificial intelligence and national security, uh, you have some set of ethical principles that you apply in the national security context. Are they the same principles that you apply in a medical context? Are they the same principles you'd apply in a medical context when you are the patient? Um, and I think in many respects, we get to very different intuitions. So I think oftentimes the answer I hear is, well, in a counterterrorism context, if we are doing the killing, then I do think there is some ethical principle here that should be deeper. Um, on the other hand, if I am looking for a diagnosis of a, a you know, biopsy of a, a tumor in my lungs, I don't really care what mechanism you use to do it as long as you maximize the chance of determining if it's cancerous or not. So uh, I do think our intuition in many respects is that there should be different standards, but there is always the student, and I think always in many cases the politician, who will say, no, it doesn't matter. This is, this is purely consequentialist. And if, if artificial intelligence can get us better results in a counterterrorism context, uh, isn't it the case that uh, we should, uh, should abide by them? And I think there's an analogy here beyond counterterrorism, but in the military realm, to, to lethal autonomous weapons. And I think... Um, when it comes to lethal autonomous weapons, our instincts in many cases are that they, are, uh, they raise questions of killing. When do we kill? But I think in many respects, the, the broader question, the more important question, as you mentioned, is a question of dying. For what principles are we willing to die? For what principles are they so important to our democracy that we are going to not use a technology that might be more effective, purely hypothetically, because we believe in these principles and we will suffer the attendant costs, even death of our soldiers or of our citizens as a result. And I, I think our intuitions here sometimes are very contradictory and I'm not in a position to resolve them, only to suggest that when we do deploy these technologies, we should strive for a more coherent set of principles before we do. I'm gonna ask Dr. Laird if, if he wants to make a comment, but perhaps I could just draw attention to something which has been in the news in the United Kingdom. Because we now operate from Nevada, what are called remotely uh, piloted aircraft. Uh, and members of the Royal Air Force sit at a console and they decide how um, a weapon is to be used uh, almost certainly um, with um, killing as a result. Uh, and there is now a recognized uh, uh, medical uh, syndrome uh, that they f f face post-traumatic stress disorder in a way which you think would be entirely um, uh, improbable. Uh, and one of the explanations given is that if you were in the... Britons are always talking about the Battle of Britain and how much we have for so, so, so many, to so few. 
but if you were a Spitfire pilot, then after a day of pressing buttons to shoot down aircraft, you went back home and you met the people in your squadron, you got absolutely pie-eyed, uh, and you had a couple of days off, and then you went and you did the same thing again. But if you do it all in an office setting with a console and without your um, equals round about to share the experience, then it can have quite severe psychological consequences. So that's a bit of a sideways um, swerve. But would you like to comment on the, on the question, Doctor? Uh, yes, certainly. But uh, my issue normally is with regard to this remotely piloted planes or drones and whatever. Um, there are people making these decisions, yeah. right? And I do remember that uh, a couple of jihadis uh, of British descent were killed over the years. Uh, one from Cardiff, uh, one from Aberdeen, for example. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no death penalty in the United Kingdom. How actually dare you to kill them just because they actually have the temerity to get out of your country? Yeah. So that's, that's the problem that I have. Yeah. And I'm a bit of a universalist here, but sometimes I'm, of course, veering towards utilitarianism. Uh, these people kill. Uh, these people go outside to fight a war somewhere. Yeah. So maybe we have to, uh, uh, to treat them as such. Uh, there are a lot of questions to be asked, but yes, uh, I think the problem is you're having a bad day in the office killing people, basically, uh, with a drone that is over Iraq, or Afghanistan, yeah. or Somalia, for that matter. And then you're coming home. There is uh, no mates, no nothing. You're not in a war zone. You're in a war zone for eight hours per day. Mm in a container and then you get out. And that makes it a bit, uh, not even arm's length, that yeah. makes it more like a game. A yeah. game, yeah. And that's, that's, I think, that's a problem that is. But some of the people being recruited are being recruited because of their gaming capabilities. Yeah. Yes, yes, and that's basically kind of, it's not real, so to speak. You play a game. And you know in a game, basically, when you actually uh, get killed the last time, you can restart the game, all the stuff. Mm. So it's not real. Uh, and that makes it a bit detached. Maybe then artificial intelligence, the drones that make hopefully clever uh, decisions uh, might be better, but I've read so many science fiction novels where that went horribly wrong, uh, so uh, I'm not really convinced. Uh, errors will be made. Uh, the, the wrong codes will be programmed. Uh, you have so many anecdotal stories about wedding parties being fired upon yeah, sure. by Apache helicopter and all this stuff. That's what Clausewitz called a fog of war. As soon as you get unleashed, the dogs of war, uh, innocents will die. And that's basically it. Uh, that's nothing you can actually uh, uh, wish away it's simply not happening. So you need to make a judgment call, and I do agree with the politicians. You need to make a decision under duress. And there is one critical infrastructure uh, specialist, Bruce Schnee, who said basically, just imagine, your politicians say, well, it's not going to happen, no, 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 we don't do that. And there's another politician said, mark my words, in a couple of years' time, it will happen. Now it happens after a couple of years. The politician said, no, it's not going to happen. His career is dead, together yeah. with lots of other people. The guy who said, well, it mark my words, he is then the man or the woman of the minute. And if it doesn't happen, that guy can still say, see, it didn't happen because I warned you and because we took predictions. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have uh, yeah, a lot of compassion for politicians yeah. because I, as a scholar, I can talk lots uh, when the day is long and nobody will listen to me or whatever. <laughs> but you need to make decisions in yeah. the end. So mm -hmm. you, uh, generals and all the stuff, these are the people who have made the decisions. So basically, that's what I need to, uh, to accept, basically. Uh, what I say basically doesn't lead to consequence in the real world. Uh, nobody gets killed on what I'm saying. So that's something that we have to acknowledge okay. as scholars. Um, enough from the platform. I see a forest of hands. So we have provoked discussion. Yes, gentlemen over there, the mic's just coming. Thank you. I'm Boaz Ganor from uh, ICT Israel. And uh, I would like to refer to the two uh, very good uh, talks. First of all, to uh, Peter Lair. I would like to, uh, to commend you for uh, actually noting that uh, when we talk about counterterrorism and technology and counterterrorism in general, we are not talking about black and white pictures. It's all about gray colors, and that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. I think you have noted uh, Shabtay Shavit for my book, The Counterterrorism Puzzle, uh, in which we discuss the democratic dilemma in counterterrorism, mm -hmm. how one can find the balance between efficiency. Uh, and in counterterrorism and guarding liberal democratic values at the same time. I think our role as scholars, you, me, and the rest of the people here, is to suggest where really this balance lies, uh, knowing that uh, probably one needs to sacrifice some of its efficiency in counterterrorism in order to guard the liberal democratic fundamental values, and maybe sometimes under severe circumstances uh, sacrifice some of the liberal democratic values in order to help some efficiency in counterterrorism. As for the AI, uh, Ben, um, I think it's needed to be noted or to differ between two types of terrorism. 
the lone wolf phenomenon or the individual attacks and the organized terrorism. The whole concept of AI in the recent years in counterterrorism, uh, especially in monitoring the internet, was aimed in order to deal with the inefficiency of intelligence to deal with lone wolves. Because uh, intelligence in general, human and comment, relies on what? On a discussion well, between two people. I'm, I'm, I'm closing. Okay. <laughs> a, a discussion between two people. In a lone wolf, everything starts and ends with the sick mind of one person. AI finds the solution for the problem of lack of discourse, and therefore you cannot intercept the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Well, but I think I'm at least there are several people in the audience who don't, of course, like the expression lone wolf for various doctrinal reasons, but I think we get the point. I, because of that, I'm, I think we might take uh, questions in threes so as to get as many people as we can. Yes. Uh, oh, yes, Alex. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, I beg your pardon. I can't see you for the lights. Thank you very much for the, uh, those um, thoughts from the panel, which I thought were very illuminating. On AI, it seems to me we need to think about this at least as much as uh, a terrorism issue, as a counter-terrorism issue, because, of course, these technologies are absolutely not uh, only in the hands of government. And it seems to me that we need to be thinking quite urgently about the ways in which these technologies can uh, be used to penetrate our own security, because exactly the same characteristics that enable us to identify uh, weaknesses in the behaviours, etc., the... the the communications of our opponents can be used back against us. And I think we only need to look at the way in which uh, AI is starting to be used in cyber malware uh, uh, creation to recognize that this can be used against us very effectively. And uh, probably the counter to it will also have to be AI. So this will be a battle of AI capabilities against AI capabilities. If you'd just like to p pass the baton to your neighbour, he'd like to ask a question. Yes, Alex Carlyle, yeah. former UK independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. I wanted to ask a question about which goes to the relationship between academics and politicians and the points that Lord Campbell raised when you'd finished speaking. Have academics left a huge gap in failing to address the ethical problems that arise from the use of AI because if academics don't provide some potential solutions, there's a real danger that the politicians will make up their minds and do so badly because pragmatically. Before AI became ubiquitous and uncontrollable, we basically understood the relationship between rights and duties. Now we have to recalibrate, do we not, that relationship? And should not therefore a conference like this possibly provide a beginning for a new ethical relationship in which one seeks to define the rights of those who use the internet and the rights of those who own the internet. And add the rights of those who are affected by the use of the internet. Yeah, three rather than two. Right. <laughs> right. These, these are three very straightforward okay. questions. Yeah, you may have simple. noticed. <laughs> right. Who's going to go first? Well, I'm, I'm may, going. May, may have, I encourage you to be brief because there's still Please. a couple of hands. Uh, right, okay, uh, uh, let's start with Lord Carlyle. Yeah, you're right, basically that's what I meant with this Rifkin quote, that basically there is a kind of a lack between these technological innovators and the politicians. You need somebody to make sense out of that. In my opinion, critically, infrastructure protection, the only thing that's critical is the infrastructure itself. You don't have a critical, critical infrastructure approach so far, like, okay, that's what the, it can do. Uh, now let's question what the effects will be, and that's basically something that needs to be done indeed. I agree with you perfectly. Uh, with regard to uh, Boris Geno, uh, yes, that's based on your book, The Conditors and Puzzle, as you know that, required reading. I agree, it's not basically about black and white, unfortunately. It's a lot of shades of grey uh, and uh, the atmosphere of fear. And I do remember in Germany in the 1970s, the late 70s, where the Red Army faction, this war of six against 60 million was enough, basically, to create an atmosphere of fear where the police got amazing uh, rights, basically, to go to a whole uh, tenement block if there was suspicion that in one apartment there might be terrorists or whatever. I know from the autobahn I was living nearby, every week, basically, there was a roadblock where every car was checked and all that stuff. It's just six people. So it depends on the magnitude of the threat, and it will do look differently in Israel than it looks in Germany or United Kingdom or whatever. I perfectly agree with that. Two quick points. I think on the terrorist use of technology, uh, by far the biggest uh, risk of terrorism using, terrorists using AI uh, comes in there, modification and application of off-the-shelf drones. 
Um, I'm a little more skeptical of terrorist use of cyber operations. I do think that AI will change cyber operations in exactly the way you, uh, you expressed. More likely it's going to be China or Russia, I think, than, than Al Qaeda. But in the, the use of drones, in commercial drones, I think quite likely we'll see that, if we've not already, as you said, um, from terrorist groups. On the role of academia, uh, I often say that I think the role of academia is to think about things that are important but not urgent. We now have a subject that, in my view, is both important and urgent. I do think there's absolutely a role, an important role for scholars here. My concern, uh, to be very blunt, is that I'm not sure that the disciplines of political science or security studies more generally have embraced the subject. There are not that many folks writing about artificial intelligence. Um, there should be many more. Right. Uh, yes, at the back. Microphone's coming. Two questions for Dr. Buchanan. You concluded your talk by saying that you didn't have answers, but I'd ask you to opine, if you could, on the potential threat to a case officer operating in the field in a hostile territory whose job task now includes interfacing with a piece of physical equipment that engages an AI platform and to what degree this would impact or impugn upon their daily job tasks, perhaps undermine the appropriate collection of human and also become discoverable by hostiles in that region. And for Dr. Lair, you referenced Minority Report, and as good and robust as that technology may be, uh, and as fascinating as that is, Philip Dick's purpose in writing that short story in the 1950s was to highlight the grave threat of the discrepancy between a robust, efficient technology and the existential threat to humanity and the potential for, three, for, for free will and decision making to occur, which uh, ultimately revealed the potential for goodness. So I'd ask for comments on both of those, please. Right. Um, Dr. Piha? Be quick. I, I think uh, artificial intelligence in combination with things like biometrics fundamentally have changed, not will change, have changed the business of undercover case officer work. Um, there's an excellent investigation by Jen McLaughlin and Zach Dorfman a month or so ago on uh, how this has changed the nature of cover and how it is simply much more difficult to sneak uh, human intelligence assets into a country to recruit human intelligence assets, in short, to do the work of being a case officer uh, in an age of biometrics and artificial intelligence. So the game has changed dramatically. Uh, I think it is an open question how quickly intelligence agencies and democracies are adjusting. Dr. Right, I think it boils down essentially to this uh, scientific question between universalism and utilitarianism between Kant and Bentham, so to speak. What do you want to do? And do you want to, ha to held up high universal um, beliefs uh, and uh, basically rights to everybody? Or do you want to make decisions uh, that care for the greater good of the greater part of your state? And I think uh, utilitarians are those... Uh, uh, who actually go into politics. I think politics, uh, politics, whether I like it or not, is not the playing ground for universalists. Uh, they will be fine divinity, for example, or whatever, or maybe in, in, in scholarship, because we don't have to make decisions. But as soon as you want to make decisions, you have to accept that whatever you do, whether it's related to technology or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's not perfect, and there are a lot of shades of gray to be explored, uh, like was Ganoa said, basically, so you can't escape. You need to make a decision, with insufficient information and the time clock is ticking, so to speak. And that basically is the fundamental problem that we have to solve. It's Nothing to do with technology, more with your assumptions. It's a rare thing in politics to find a politician who's a scholar. You have academics, but you don't necessarily have people that you would mm. describe in um, as scholars of, of politics. I just wondered if the case officer issue was derived from personal experience. Or was it a purely hypothetical suggestion? A. A. Thank you. <laughs> Suitably enigmatic. Right. Uh, more hands, please? Yes. Ah. And I think there are a couple at the back as well. Uh, and we'll take three at a time, if we may. Thank you. Sorry to give you the runaround. Um, Tim Wilson, CSDV Director. Uh, thank you both for two bracingly dystopian papers to wake <laughs> us up first thing in the morning. Um, my question is one of wide-eyed horizons and wide-eyed naivety from a technophobe. Um, not just that, but a technophobe historian. 
is there any good news? Is there any good news for human dignity and human liberty? It doesn't seem very long ago, as I recall, that following the commentary on the Arab Spring, one might have been half persuaded that it was impossible to have revolutions for liberty without social media from people who had clearly never studied the French Revolution. Um, but is there, as I say, to be more serious, is there any good news for, from a libertarian point of view? Right. Uh, there was another hand at the back. Yes. I think the microphone's come to you. Hello. Uh, two good presentations. Um, could, where could, could, loss could of privacy... Could you speak up a little? Would you mind, actually, would you mind standing up? For, forgive me. That's helpful. Thank you. Well, where loss of privacy would be considered in the West an inconvenience and an ethical dilemma, in other places it could be considered a benefit. So, for example, technology that's used to illicitly spy on individuals might be viewed as a feature, not a bug, in the PRC. Um, can you guys speak to where the security community is at on collaborating with US-based non-state actors like Google and Facebook in um, keeping technology managed when it comes to its use by authoritarian regimes. Right, and I saw one more, yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is a real keep fit class, yeah. I can tell you. <laughs> So uh, similarly, um, obviously we need the police, the military, the state to be the executor of the actions, right, to, in terms of counterterrorism, they need to apprehend the individual. But um, what the panelists said is basically, you know, private industry changes faster and adapts faster to the threat. And so, um, as Dr. Lair said, you know, several small little brothers rather than one um, big brother. So I would be interested in your opinions on how to address that, um, how private industry could enable, or would they want to even, um, given you know the uh, sort of capitalist bent to what what uh, drives their um, their motives, perhaps. Um, but you know, if they're able to get in front of uh, the terrorist or the threat before the government is, and yet the government is the action arm of sorts, how how do we address that? How does um, policy help enable that sort of thing? Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on this group of three? Okay, group of two. Right, so, okay, uh, first, uh, Tim Wilson, the ES. Uh, three, I beg your pardon. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is actually uh, there is some, 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 some hope. For example, if you take a look at North Korea, the land of, of rocket men, uh, and there are now smartphones as well. There are Chinese SIM cards and all that stuff, which means that people can at least see what's behind the Great Wall the Great Firewall, so to speak, and that's much more than you can get normally in North Korea, so people get aware of what's happening in the outside world, so it might change the society. I was talking with some North Koreans in my class, Asian security, and they say basically people know what's happening outside, so technology is an enabler. Also, with regard to revolutions and rebellions, the government can't keep things under wrap. Uh, I remember in Thailand, for example, uh, there is, well, the last revolution, the last takeover of the army, for example, people talked on, on Twitter and whatever. Uh, uh, so basically, it's, things get out there. People either know and can react, they can actually organize and all that stuff. So there's a, a kind of hope that something can, uh, that technology is actually beneficial. It enables us basically to do awesome things. I do remember when I was younger, a specialist in South Asia, I had to wait until the physical copies of Times of India came uh, via ship or plane or whatever. Now I can read it as soon as it's published, if I have time actually. So actually technology in the end is, I'm not a technophobe, technology is beneficial. I have actually more smartphones than I have arms. Uh, so basically that tells you something. With regards to uh, uh, private companies, and I think that goes in your direction as well, you see uh, they do A here and B, C, D, whatever over there. Uh, Facebook, for example, or, or Apple, for example, wants to actually protect all the information that we get in the cloud uh, to keep it out of the, uh, the fingers of security services. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, I don't really know. But as soon as you go over to China, you need to deal with them. There's a lot of money in China, and of course they do human rights in a different way, if they do human rights at all. So if you want to earn money, if you're Google or whatever, you have to sing their songs, so to speak, otherwise you get frozen out. And I think that's an issue that, as a private company, which is actually about stakeholders, about shareholders and money, that's a problem that you have to solve. Think about uh, uh, this one Belt and Road initiative that China has. Uh, there's trillions of dollars in it and all this stuff. Uh, 
I dare you as a private company man to stay out of that. Uh, you will go bankrupt at some time. So I think that's the kind of a decision, hard decision again it need mm -hmm. to make. What are we there for? Google always said uh, don't do ever. Uh, they have ditched that slogan nowadays uh, because it's no longer appropriate I think. Uh, but that's a problem that we have to solve. The world is changing, not only technology, also the world is changing. China gets ever bigger, different topic of course that we don't need to discuss. But there will be sacrifices to be made. There will be victims along the road, I speak, I, I'd say. And you see how actually our politicians are very careful not to annoy the big dragon. Or our uh, Daimler-Benz, for example, BMW and all the stuff, uh, all the cars get flocked over there. It doesn't if you actually do, if you ride them in the wrong way. And I think that's a problem that will re in, actually reframe human rights. Uh, and uh, I think that's not a good thing. So there's a lot in us uh, on the technological side, uh, it can help us. On the other side, and that's just money basically. Uh, I think our world order is changing into what direction, um, I'm not, I don't know yet. And sacrifices will have to be made, I feel. Well, I mean, very quickly, there is something of an inhibition uh, in the present uh, government, and indeed the, pres uh, the previous government, about expressing strong views on Hong Kong or the treatment of the Ouija's. Why is that? Because the level of Chinese investment in the United Kingdom is very significant uh, and increasing. Very interesting moral dilemma. Dr. Buchanan. So I think there's cause for hope and cause for concern. The cause for hope is very simple. When you look at artificial intelligence, what it's poised to do in, in many aspects of daily life, perhaps none more important than medical and scientific research, is potentially extraordinary. And I think it's, it's no exaggeration to say we may all be living much better lives as a direct result of some of this technology. The cause for concern is what does this mean for democracy? And I think the, the first question and the second question relate in this regard. Um, I recall being a, a Georgetown student. Georgetown, to its infinite credit, was the only university that did not cancel programs in Egypt during the Arab Spring. So one of, uh, I was one of the ones who went dutifully to, to Egypt to study Arabic and think about democracy. And I recall seeing this giant mural in, in Egypt in the summer of 2011, sort of an homage to Facebook and what Facebook would mean for the Egyptian revolution. Uh, I was skeptical at the time that Facebook had much to do with it, and I was skeptical the revolution would work. And unfortunately, I think both causes are right. And as the second question uh, suggests, in many respects, the central challenge of authoritarianism throughout history has been one of centralizing control. And I fear that artificial intelligence, for the same reasons it can be used in counterterrorism contexts or policing contexts, will be quite beneficial to authoritarians in their context. The, the challenge before us, I think, is to find a way to recognize the benefits, the cause for hope for this technology uh, in science, in medicine, in how we uh, live on a day-to-day -day basis, while also preserving the, the essence of our democracy. And I fear that AI will do more for autocracy than it will do for democracy. We've got time for one more round, if anyone has, uh, no? Um, okay, we're a little ahead. I, I see plates being in, which I think is lunch. Uh, and we're due to have a break, so I don't think it's the lunch break, but I may be corrected. Uh, but I think you can have coffee, because that still seems to be available. Um, all that's necessary for me is to thank our two speakers, who, if I must say so, got us off to a very, very good start. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, someone's responsibility should be to write down all the questions which all the speakers have asked uh, and to tick the box as to whether they've provided answers at the same time. Uh, ratings will be made available later. <laughs> but... Uh, but on your behalf, may I thank our two speakers.